Thermopylae, Greece, 480 BC. The now legendary 300 Spartans faced down a force of thousands of Persian adversaries. Saragori, the Tira region, 1897. 21 Sikh soldiers remain at their signaling post as up to 12,000 Afridi and Oraksai tribesmen bear down upon them. Kapyong, Korea, 1951. UN troops find themselves outnumbered 5 to 1 by two Chinese divisions. The idea of the last stand, of battling on against impossible odds, is found throughout military history, but some examples are better known than others. Whether you know about the events at Longawala in 1971 might depend on where you're from. If you're from India, it's likely you know this story very well, as it has become etched onto the public consciousness over the last half century. For those elsewhere, unless you have a keen and comprehensive knowledge of 20th century warfare, you may not be quite so familiar. But the actions of the small Indian force at Longwala deserve to take their place in this storied pantheon. This is the tale of the defenders of a small military outpost who stood up to an invading force many times their size and emerged victorious. This is Longawala. India's Thermopylae and a pivotal moment in the India-Pakistan War of 1971. While you're here with us, we'd like to invite you to explore our Ko-fi page. If you don't know what Ko-fi is, it's essentially Patreon without all the censorship and political baggage. Your support on Ko-fi directly fuels our ability to produce unique and exciting content that might otherwise remain hidden in the depths of the YouTube algorithm. In fact, some of our existing videos, like the ones on the Chaco War, the Beagle Conflict, and Morris Cohen's incredible journey, haven't received the recognition we believe they truly deserve. But we're determined not to shy away from such important topics, even if they might not align with the algorithm's preferences for promotion. With your support on Ko-fi, we can give videos like these a second chance, ensuring that these valuable stories and insights reach a wider audience without any concerns about our profitability month by month. We also haven't forgotten to include some awesome weekly and monthly perks for our supporters, so make sure you check out the link below. The partitioning of India in 1946 was supposed to create two distinct zones, the Hindu majority India in the south and the Muslim majority Pakistan in the north. In fact, it created three, Pakistan was split in two, divided by geography, 2,000 kilometers consisting of a large portion of northern India and all of Nepal separate west and east Pakistan, as well as by culture and language. All of those speaking Pakistanis were the majority in the west, while the east was inhabited predominantly by Bengalis, alongside the Urdu speaking Bihari community that had moved into the region following the partition. Elections in March of 1971 gave Bengalis in East Pakistan the chance to make their displeasure known. The Awami League, a Bengali nationalist party, won the elections, offering hope that East Pakistan and her people would gain more representation in the country. It wasn't to be. The authorities in West Pakistan simply ignored the election results and sent troops to put down any dissent. The Awami leader, Sheikh Mojibur Rahman, understanding what was taking place, declared East Pakistan, or Bangladesh, to be an independent state on March 26, and the Bangladesh Liberation War began. For more than eight months in 1971, the Bangladeshis fought for the survival of their new nation. At the same time, brutal West Pakistani crackdowns, known as Operation Searchlight, continued. The Pakistani army, aided by Islamist groups in Bangladesh, carried out a program of ethnic cleansing, killing between 300,000 and 3 million Bengali Hindus in a remarkably savage period of Asian history. By the end of the year, Bangladesh would be free, but it had paid for its freedom with a sickening loss of life. As the events in the East unfolded, war between India and Pakistan was inevitable. As early as April 1971, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, under pressure from some of the more militaristic sections of her cabinet, met with the chief of the army staff, Sam Manikshaw, to discuss the possibility of a preliminary strike against Pakistan. Manikshaw refused and resigned his position, only to be reinstated after Gandhi promised that he could plan an assault 
at his own pace. Meanwhile, the Bangladeshi Mukti Bahini guerrilla resistance force, led by Muhammad Atwal Ghani Osmani, was conducting raids in East Pakistan. The Pakistani government believed India was supporting these raids, and they were right. So President Yahya Khan began making plans of his own. Operation Chengiz Khan represented the first international escalation of war. This was to be a series of preemptive airstrikes against targets in India, beginning on December 3rd, planned and executed by Abdul Rahim Khan, the head of Pakistan's Air Force. Modelled on the Israeli strikes that had been so successful in the Six-Day War four years previously, this operation was intended to smash the Indian Air Force before it could get off the ground. It did no such thing. Suffering only minimal damage from the strikes, India called Operation Chengiz Khan a declaration of war. Now, both sides had the fight they wanted. At Longewala, near Jasalmaya on the border between India's Rajasthan state and West Pakistan, Major Kuldip Singh Chanpuri now had a very difficult decision to make. Commanding a company of only 120 men, he was now potentially right on the front line, with Pakistan in front of him and India at his back. He could flee with his men, or he could stand. A veteran of the India-Pakistan War of 1965, and known for his bravery and excellent leadership, there was only really one outcome for Chanpuri. He chose to stand. Chanpuri's call was both brave and audacious. His company consisted of just 120 men of the Punjab regiment, supported by a handful of guards from the border security force. The force had only two medium machine guns and two L-16 mortars, as well as four anti-tank rocket launchers. They had no armor. Their offensive vehicles consisted of just two Jonga jeeps, each fitted with 106mm recoilless guns. Coming their way was a significant Pakistani force. Major General B. M. Mustafa sent two mobile infantry brigades, consisting of between 2,000 and 3,000 men, to take Longawala, along with 40 tanks and a field regiment supported by two artillery batteries. The Pakistani High Command understood the realities of their situation. Battling a revolt in Bangladesh was one thing, but the international community would not tolerate a lengthy war between Pakistan and India. Pakistani actions had to be swift, and they had to be effective, commandeering as much Indian territory as possible, and then using this as a bargaining tool in the negotiations to follow. First, however, they had to take that territory. This should have been relatively easy. With activity concentrated around the eastern frontier with Bangladesh, the forces on India's actual border with Pakistan were less well equipped. General Mustafa believed his forces could sweep through Longawala and into India itself. Chanpuri and his men, of course, had other ideas. The Thar Desert is a vast arid plain covering 200,000 square kilometers of land on the Indian-Pakistani border. In the summer, it's scorching hot, up to 50 degrees Celsius, but in December, the temperatures fall to around 5 degrees. Dunes undulate across the surface, making forward motion difficult for an advancing army, while the lack of trees and other vegetation makes cover scarce. These were the conditions that both forces had to contend with on December 4th, as the Pakistani contingent advanced toward the Indian position. While the Pakistani forces greatly outnumbered their Indian opponents, the lack of cover was a real headache. Even at night, the full moon in a cloudless sky bathed the battlefield in an eerie glow, and advancing units could be spotted and targeted from some distance away. The terrain and conditions certainly favoured the defenders, but there must have been real worry among the Indian troops about the vulnerability of their lightly defended position. Halting the Pakistani advance would mean preventing a large swath of Indian soil from falling into enemy hands. But first, they had to win the battle. The Indian forces knew something was happening. The airstrikes of Operation Chengiz Khan had begun the previous day, and the men at Longawala understood that a ground assault was likely. Second Lieutenant Dharam Veer, commanding 20 men, was dispatched to the very edge of the frontier around 12 kilometers away to look for troop movements beyond the border. It didn't take Veer and his men long to pick up on something strange. 
the rumblings of armored vehicles on the Pakistani side. Their fears were confirmed by intelligence from the army's air observation post. A column of tanks 20 meters long was on its way to Longwala. Chanpuri placed an urgent call to his battalion headquarters. They needed reinforcements and they needed them now. The reply was not what he wanted to hear. No reinforcements would be coming tonight. Chanpuri could, the headquarters told him, stand and fight as best he could, or he could retreat along the tarmac road to Ramga. They could easily make it back to this stronger position, but Chanpuri declined the offer to retreat. It was artillery shells that reached Longawala first. At around half past midnight, the first ordnance came screaming out of the sky from positions across the border, slamming into the Indian position and killing half of the border security forces camels. Chanpuri and his men knew that this was only heralding a much larger attack, and they set about creating anti-tank defenses to thwart the attack. Hastily buried mines dotted the desert sand in front of the position as the infantrymen returned to the post to mount the defense. As the tanks rumbled into view, the defenders were ordered to hold their nerve as the outpost smoldered from the artillery barrage. Finally, when the column was between 15 and 30 meters from the position, they opened fire with their anti-tank guns, knocking out two of the tanks with rounds fired from their Jongo vehicles. The spare fuel tanks mounted on the armor for their planned advance through to Jalsmia, ignited, and the battlefield was lit up. The Indians opened fire once again, sowing more damage and confusion before the thick smoke of the burning fuel cloaked the column. The Pakistani column had lost the element of surprise, the opening engagement, and a number of its tanks in the process. They may have been fighting on favorable terrain, but the desert alone would not guarantee Chanpuri and his men victory. As well as the hastily laid mines around their perimeter, the defenders also had barbed wire, something that Pakistani intelligence failed to notice. As their attack began, the Pakistani line sagged as many of its tanks became caught in the wire defenses they hadn't expected to be there. This made the initial wave of tanks an easy target for the resilient Indian defenders who manned their guns with steely determination. In areas where there were no mines, Pakistani units wasted valuable time probing for minefields that did not exist. With every minute lost, the advantage tipped toward Chanpuri and his 127 men. With the frontal assault now a failure, the invading force changed their tactics. They would encircle the position, leaving the road and hitting Longawala at the flanks and the rear. But this, too, floundered as the heavy Pakistani vehicles struggled in the soft sand, leaving yet more immobile targets for the Indians to hit. The night was slipping away. If the Pakistani forces had been exposed by the full moon, they would be sitting ducks when daylight came. They'd lost 12 tanks in the night, but they still had the weight of numbers and weaponry on their side. As dawn rose, the Pakistani troops readied themselves for another desperate assault, this time from all sides. It was only now that the defenders at Longawala knew they were not alone. Delayed by a lack of night vision equipment, the warplanes of the Indian Air Force took to the skies at dawn, arriving just in time to provide further support to the defenders. 122 Squadron, led by Wing Commander Mohinder Singh Bawa, sent seven planes to support the defenders on the ground. Four British-designed Hawker Hunters and three of India's own HAL Marut fighters ran dawn sorties over the battlefield, training their Matra T-10 rockets and 30mm cannons on the Pakistani troops who were now in disarray. Pakistan had its own planes, but these were tied up in actions elsewhere, leaving the 18th Infantry with no aerial support whatsoever. It was, according to some Indian Air Force officers, a turkey shoot. But this only tells part of the story. While they were alone in the sky, the Indian fighter pilots were not out of danger. Wing Commander Bawa ordered an almost incessant barrage of the Pakistani lines, which sometimes meant sending out only a single plane to strafe the invading forces. These planes came in low, and the Pakistani ground troops had nothing else to do but fire back. There were near misses. The closest call came when a T-59 tank loosed a 100mm round at a low-flying hunter, whistling past its cockpit and temporarily disabling its controls. 
The pilot narrowly avoided crashing into the desert, reportedly scraping the tops of the sand dunes as he pulled back into the sky. With air attacks coming thick and fast, and with no support on its way, the Pakistani 18th Infantry knew a further assault was impossible. They withdrew from their advanced positions, mulling over what to do next. Chanpuri and his Punjab regiment had their victory, but their numbers were too small to leave their post and strike the killing blow. On December 7th, 1971, the arrival of the Rajputana rifles and 20th Lancers, complete with tanks, sent what remained of the Pakistani troops fleeing back across the border. The Battle of Longawala had been won, against all odds, by the Indian forces. It really was an astonishing victory for the Indian troops at Longawala. They'd stood up to 40 tanks and as many as 3,000 soldiers with no more than 127 men and zero tanks of their own. 36 of those Pakistani tanks were now out of action, coughing out black smoke and burning in the desert. Around 22 of these had been destroyed by the airborne sorties of the IAF, while ground anti-tank fire had knocked out 12. Two additional tanks were abandoned and captured. At least 100, and possibly as many as 500, of Pakistan's other military vehicles lay damaged or destroyed, strewn across the desert around the outpost. Some 200 Pakistani soldiers lay dead. The Indians had lost only two of their number, although the losses wounded them deeply. So how had they managed all of this? Through a combination of factors. One was certainly tenacity. Major Chanpuri had served in the War of 65 and had seen Pakistani forces overrun significant areas of Indian territory. He wasn't going to let the same thing happen again on his watch, and neither were his men. They were going to stick it out, whatever happened. But perhaps more important was the tactical noose portrayed by these men. They laid mines where they could. They stuck to their positions and even held their fire until the last possible moment, knowing they had to make every shot count. Air support would come, but it would not arrive until the following day, so the defenders knew that the conservation of fire and effort, as well as smart tactics, were crucial. Of course, the IAF also played a role. The Air Force was later criticised for not being ready to run missions on December 4th, after Pakistani airstrikes had already rocked northwestern India, but they made up for that from December 5th, applying the pressure that would eventually win the battle for India. Let's not forget that Longawala came on only the second day of the war and was an extremely decisive engagement. Pakistan lost their ability to launch an invasion of India. They'd had their shot and they'd been turned back at Longawala. With no Indian territory in their control, Pakistan essentially had very little to bargain with. For the remainder of the war, the focus shifted to the east. Here, India could concentrate her forces, pushing for the final surrender of East Pakistan command and liberating Bangladesh less than two weeks later. While there were no territorial changes in the West, the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 was a disaster for Pakistan and the writing was very much on the wall after only two days of fighting. In terms of Indian military policy, a great deal was learned from Longawala. The results of the battle showed commanders how important it was for ground forces and air units to work together pulling off combined arms maneuvers that would change the way the armed forces operated. As far as foreign policy was concerned, the destinies of India and Bangladesh became closely entwined, while India and Pakistan fostered long-term grievances that remain to this day. The victory at Longwala is a point of pride for Indians, but it's also been a point of disagreement. The film Border, starring Sunny Diolo as Major Chanpuri, was released in 1997 to real critical and commercial acclaim. Viewers praised the film's handling of events, which, while perhaps not exactly even-handed, gave a good indication of what took place on those few days in early December 1971. But some historians, particularly those associated with the Indian Air Force, took another view. They believed the film played down the role of air power in breaking the siege, making it look as if the Punjab regiment had won the battle single-handedly. Later disagreements would argue the other way. In 2008, Major General Atma Singh and Air Marshal Mahinda Singh Bawa, who had been a wing commander during Longawala, were cited in a civil court 
for decrying the actions of Major Chanpuri and his men. According to Singh Anbawa, it had been the Air Force that saved Longawala, not the Punjab Regiment. Bawa would even author a book, released in 2013, that reiterated these claims. An incensed Chanpuri sued Singh and Bawa for defamation, not for money, he stated, but for honor. Chanpuri's suit was successful, his reputation was protected, and he was awarded a single symbolic rupee in damages. Arguing over who did what at Longawala seems petty, when the Indian Armed Forces achieved such a monumental victory in that corner of the Thar Desert. Most would agree that it was the heroism of the Longwala company, as well as the daring sorties run by a 122 squadron that won the day. Chanpuri himself was awarded the Mahavir Chakra, the second highest award for gallantry, for conspicuous gallantry, inspiring leadership and exceptional devotion. A number of other awards were handed out to the troops on that day, as their deeds and their stories passed into Indian legend. The fact that the Battle of Longawala is mentioned in the same breath as events like Thermopylae, when 300 Spartans fought a suicidal rearguard action against the much larger Persian force, shows us just how resonant the action has been in Indian culture. But while the themes of valor, sacrifice, loyalty, and enduring grit are all present here, the story of Longawala ended very differently to that of the Spartans at Thermopylae. In this story, the underdogs won. But what do you think of the actions at Longawala? How pivotal was the battle in the Indo-Pakistani war and in the regional geopolitics that would follow? Let us know in the comments section below and as always guys thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.